call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the meeting of the Board of Directors regularly scheduled meeting for Thursday, September 9th, Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould? Here. Orzali is absent. Director Wood? Here. Sheets? Here. Director Jones is also absent. Director White? Here. Clark? I see him connecting. Director Clark? Yes. Are you you're present? Perfect. Yes, present. Taylors? Here. And Kelly? Present. Thank you. Uh, next would be the pledge to the flag. If everybody could repeat after Director Wood. Pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the Republic for which, for which it stands, one, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. All right, the Metro Cable announcement. Uh, the open session meeting is videotaped for Cablecast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Monday, September 13th at 6 p.m. and Wednesday, September 15th at 6 p.m. On channel 14 webcast at metro14live.sacccounty.net. If you uh, take note that the Metro Cable has a new webcast address as uh, was previously mentioned. All right then, public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within district jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, are there any speakers? Nobody contacted me ahead of time, but Art, if you could please unmute now the attendees. Um, the attendees, you now have the ability to unmute yourselves if there's anything you'd like to present to the board at this time. No response. Appear, appears that we have no speakers. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. What's your pleasure with the consent agenda? I'll second. Uh, motion by Director Sheets, second by Director Sailors. Are there any questions on the consent calendar? Mr. Chair, I have a question. Please proceed, Director Gould. Thank you. Um, just quickly, as we purchase these uh, Type 1 engines and the new ladder truck, I'm wondering if the expert in the room can give us any idea for the public edification of the total number of dollars approximately that we save when we purchase these uh, pieces of equipment in these large collectives. I just think it's important that the public understand that when we do these kinds of purchase programs with our fellow public agencies, we save the taxpayer a lot of money. And I think as we, we go about this evening purchasing some pretty expensive equipment that we at least hear some general idea of what kind of money our organization may be saving versus purchasing it one off by ourselves. Thank you, Director Gould. So I'll, I'll take that, Director Gould. Um, depending on the purchase, because those can range anywhere from ten dollars to $50,000 items all the way up to multi-million dollar things. Right. Um, again, anywhere from Ten to fifty thousand dollars per unit on a smaller rig, up to well over a hundred thousand for the big aerials. It um, it ranges, changes every year. I don't have an exact number, but it is significant. Sure, and I and I think that's all I was looking for is to just continue to remind the the public that constantly our staff are looking for opportunities to save money because, as you can imagine, someone seeing what the ladder truck is costing us, they may think that we're going out there and just purchasing willy-nilly the you know the Cadillac as it were but when we do these kinds of things you all work very hard at ensuring that we're finding the very best price for the for the appropriate equipment that we can and so I just wanted to reinforce that idea for the public thank you Mr. Chair and thank you sir for answering 
certainly. Uh, any other fur further questions on the consent calendar? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Clerk Gould? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. Sailors? Aye. And Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to our final 2021-22 uh, fiscal year uh, final budget, uh, Mr. Campo. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Kelly and members of the board. Um, we're here to present the uh, final budget for fiscal year 21-22. Um, before I kick that off, I'd just like to mention that we did review this final budget with the Audit and Finance Committee on August 26th. Um, and Chief Harms, I don't know if you have any comments you'd like to make before we kick it off. Go right into it. Okay. <laughs> Keep right on moving. Um, so we did uh, adopt the. Uh, oh shoot! <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't. Uh, that was I hope it wasn't directed to you. <laughs> uh, just as a reminder, uh, we did. Uh, the board did adopt the preliminary budget uh, June 10, uh, 2021. As a reminder, that budget was essentially. Balanced with expenditures and transfers out equal to revenues transfers in. So the final budget has uh, some additional some some changes. Number one is the higher estimated property tax revenue. So property tax revenue we've increased about one point nine million dollars. It was based on a higher assessed valuation that we received from the county in early July. So that assessed value information indicated the increase would be the preliminary budget uh, projected an increase of about 4% in property tax revenue. And based on the higher assessed value amounts, it looks like it's about 5.1%, 5.2%. So more in line with where it was uh, uh, last year. So that generated some additional uh, property tax revenue. Um, overall, uh, Revenue is up about 2.3 million. So there's some additional items that we'll, we'll talk about later. On the spending side, uh, we increased the budget about $488,000 for a couple of items that we'll um, discuss when we get to the expenditure slide. So with the estimated beginning balance of about $34 million, um, the projected reserve at the end of next year is going to be about $36 million, which is around 15.2%. So uh, well within well within the range that the, the, the board is looking for in terms of the reserve. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to see, but this is just a comparison on the uh, general fund budget. So across the top are uh, revenues. There we go. So you can, um, you can see on the revenues it's at about $240 million there, um, an increase of uh, about $2.1 million as primarily the property tax revenue, um, some smaller increases in uh, service charges. And uh, I mentioned 2.3 million overall, you will see down toward the bottom transfers in, we're projecting about a $200,000 uh, increase in the transfers in. So those two amounts that 2.3 million increase in revenues for the year. The second line is labor costs. You can see at 200 and roughly 204 million, that's down about 246,000 from preliminary. And that's as we discussed, uh, I think in one of our closed sessions, we've got the um, final premium uh, increases uh, for the CalPERS uh, health plan. And we plug those numbers in and it actually resulted in a slight decrease in labor costs. Uh, supplies and services about two hundred sixty-three thousand. Uh, I can clear this up for you real quick. Yeah, did look a little fuzzy. Yeah, that's clear now. Not, not much bigger, but <laughs> <laughs> pretty Uh, 
Um, so overall expenditures, uh, about 375,000 uh, increase. You'll see taxes, license, debt service, and others, 355,000 increase from preliminary, primarily related to GE and TV and uh, QAF uh, expenses. We'll, we'll talk about those. Um, I mentioned 488,000 increase in spending from prelims. So if you look down below, there's a $100,000 increase in transfers out. So those two combined to the overall 488,000 increase. Here we go. So uh, we have about a $1.7 million uh, improvement. Um, when you look at the revenues, uh, um, less uh, expenses. And then overall um, transfers uh, net Increase of about a hundred thousand dollars. That two hundred sixteen thousand for the general fund uh, transfers in is related to the refinancing of the lease revenue bonds and, and part of the savings and debt service that's allocated between general fund and the uh, lease properties uh, fund. So, bottom line, um, pre preliminary budget again was. It, Roughly break even. We were positive about two hundred seventy-eight thousand. We're now looking at about closer to two point one million. So about a one point eight million dollar uh, improvement in uh, overall fund balance. This is a slide the uh, board is familiar with. Just taking a look at uh, overall revenues uh, over time. As the chief pointed out, uh, we're making this presentation to the finance committee. One more year, and we lose that uh, debt at the, at the very front, and then it's, it's all positive going up. But you can see that rather, uh, you know, positive uh, increase in property tax revenue starting about 2013, and also the the widening gap between um, other revenues and, and property taxes is the districts. Uh, been more aggressive in terms of uh, uh, medic cost recovery, uh, GEMT, QA, all of those elements uh, are in that other uh, revenue uh, category. So you can see how that's grown over time. So this is just a different way of looking at uh, overall revenues and uh, other funding sources. Uh, overall, about $250 million. The bulk of that being, of course, uh, your property tax revenue at uh, about 70%, and then uh, charges for services at 23%. That's primarily the uh, medic uh, cost recovery, um, and then inter intergovernmental operating transfers and, and uh, other revenue sources. So, again, not, not a whole lot of change here other than really the property tax uh, revenue. So and this is just kind of a recap. Um, property taxes and intergovernmental revenues are up about seven and a half million dollars compared to last fiscal year. Charges for services at 5.3 million. These items we uh, covered in the preliminary budget. Again, very important. Net IGT uh, the revenue is at 9.4 million. That's assuming that the same level of activities uh, as the current year. All told, uh, 250 million dollars and. Uh, General fund revenues and finance resources. This is the same kind of pie chart for uh, district spending. Overall, about $248 million. So we have that $2 million uh, um, surplus or uh, uh, positive spread between revenues and spending. And of course, labor costs being the largest component, the 80, 82%, and then services and supplies. At 33 million, um, representing another 15 percent. And then we have the operating transfers out, primarily transfers to the capital outlay fund to fund capital expenditures, and then uh, taxes, licenses, and debt service. And we'll take a look at the, some of the components of those items. So uh, the 204 million dollar labor budget that's up about five million dollars over the uh, uh, current year. 
some of the major uh, changes, or she said previous year, uh, some of the major changes is that we were budgeting for all uh, positions uh, being uh, filled. So that increased that rate of budget about $5 million. We have about $6 million in uh, increases in pension costs, OPEB, medical contributions, again, partly because we're assuming all those positions are going to be filled. And if all those positions are filled, then we don't need as much overtime. So we drop that overtime budget by about $6 million. Now, if we get to mid-year and we're not able to fill all those positions, then we'll transfer some of those monies down from salaries and benefits back into overtime. I mentioned services and supplies at $33 million. This is a, it represents an increase of about $4.5 million over last fiscal year. Um, so the board's well aware, one and a half million of that is for your property <coughs> and liability insurance. Uh, $600,000 uh, increase in the contribution to the Sacramento Regional Fire Emergency Communication Center. That's uh, the district's uh, additional contribution. Uh, $400,000 in uh, safety clothing and supplies uh, related to the firefighter academies, and about $300,000 related to uh, GMT. GMT and Quad. So, car quality insurance. So, this is that other category of debt service assessments and contributions. About $1.9 million of that uh, $4.7 million is uh, the annual payment to uh, Sacramento County for property tax administration. All the agencies receiving property tax have to contribute toward the cost of the property tax administration program. 2.2 million assessment uh, to the state for GEMT. Uh, the, the bulk of that gets reimbursed uh, from other agencies. So the district is fronting that money uh, for the GEMT program uh, uh, administered by the state. And then the district bills the other participating agencies to uh, recover those amounts. And then uh, again, the reduced uh, debt service payments uh, for the lease revenue bond refinance that split roughly 50 50 between the general fund and the lease properties uh, fund. Finally, uh, transfers out of $6 million to the capital facilities funds for some of the items that you saw uh, earlier. And we'll take a look at that on the next slide. But that's about $500,000 less than we did uh, last year as a transfer. So in a capital facilities fund, we have proposed capital expenditures of $9 million. So the board approved a big chunk of that uh, this evening on your consent calendar. But that uh, budget includes uh, three type one engines, uh, two type three engines, the truck, and uh, three type five engines, and a water tanker, some of the major uh, purchases planned for this year. The grants fund, uh, there's about $2 million in expenditures uh, for several open, open grants. And you'll be receiving the funds or have received the, 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 the grant funds for those expenditures. And it's also including a $33,000 grant that's on the agenda. Uh, it's uh, upcoming after this. Lease properties fund is balanced. Uh, um, we have about $1.1 million in uh, lease revenue and about $1.1 million expenditure to maintain uh, those lease problems. And lastly, uh, the development impact fee fund. It's about $1.3 million projected uh, revenues of, of uh, development fees to, to be collected and 5.1 million budgeted, it's a little hard to see here at the bottom, 5.1 million budgeted uh, for the construction of uh, Station 68. It's now open. Not yet. Not yet. Almost. 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 And that's, uh, that's my brief presentation on the pretty much the difference between the preliminary budget and the final budget. We have to answer the questions. Thank you, Mr. Campo. Yes, sir. Uh, do directors, any directors have questions of uh, Mr. Campo on the uh, preliminary, the, prelim the fiscal year final budget, excuse me. Seeing no questions, 
All right. Uh, I think we've all been around long enough to understand that each of these need to be taken separately. So please don't be shy. Uh, what's your pleasure with uh, A? Sure, I make a motion that we adopt uh, A resolution 2021-22 final budget for the general operating fund 212A. Second. Thank you. We've got a motion by director, uh, by director Sheets and uh, second by director Clark. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Parker Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Pierce. And Kelly. Aye. She passes. Pleasure with uh, item B. Chair. Sure. 1B. I uh, like a. Uh, Staff's recommendation for resolution 2021-22 final budget for the capital facilities fund to go. We have a motion by Director Sheets and a second by Director Sailors. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. Aye. Passes. All right. Action one. 1C. Mr. Chair, make a motion to uh, adopt staff's uh, recommendation for resolutions 2021-22 final budget for the grants fund 212G. I'll second it. Thank you, Director Sheets. Uh, we have a motion by Director Sheets and a second by Director Sailors. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould. Aye. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. What is your pleasure with the action item 1D? Motion for resolution 2122 final budget for the development impact fees from the I second it. We have a direct, uh, we have a motion by Director Sailors and a second by Director, or excuse me, a motion by Director Sheets and a second by Director Sailors. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Parker Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Mark. Aye. Taylor. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. Passes. Item 1E. Make a motion that we adopt staff's recommendation for the resolution 2021-22 final budget for the leased properties fund to 12L. I second it. Once again, we have a motion by Director Saylor for Sheets and a second by Director Sailors. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. Motion passes. Item 1F, what is your pleasure? Sorry, make a, a motion to adopt staff's recommendation for resolution 2021-22 final budget for the IGT fund 212M. I second. We have a motion by Director Sheets and a second by Director Sailors. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Sailors. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. Passes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, action item two. The fiscal year 2020 State Homeland Security Grant Program Award Acceptance. Ms. Castleberry. Good evening, directors, here and there. Um, pleased to be here tonight to request the board's acceptance of a fiscal year 20 State Homeland Security Grant Award in the amount of $33,723 for a project to um, install enhanced controlled access systems at several of our fire stations. Um, earlier this year, we submitted three applications for Shish Gap. Uh, the total was about 440,000. One was a, an application for 370,000 for the access control program. Another was about 70,000 that was for a hazmat trace detection analyzer. 
And finally, the third allocation was about 26,000, and that was for a supply and equipment cash for the Sacramento Regional Incident Management Team. Um, the SRIMT application was not awarded. The Hazmat Trace Detection Analyzer was not funded through SHISHCAP. However, it was subsequently submitted through UOC for grant funding, and it was approved, and we have received that approval. And finally, the application for the access control was partially funded in a scaled-down project um, based on the amount of funds that SHISHCAP had available. So we will be hopefully moving forward with that and being more acceptance. Of note, we also submitted an application on behalf of the Sacramento Regional Fire and EMS Communication Center that totaled around $550,000. And that was for a CAD uh, software enhancement live move up module. So um, basically, my understanding is it helps uh, real time anal an analysis of figuring out where um, move ups should happen um, with with artificial intelligence versus relying on the dispatcher to do that. So it should increase efficiency um, for the whole comp center. So that actually was funded. That's gonna be a grant between uh, the comp center and SAC OES, but we will be assisting with the management of that grant. So if you don't have any questions, I would ask that you approve the grant award. Are there any questions of Ms. Castleberry? What's your pleasure with the item? Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I move the adoption of the grant acceptance resolution for the approved fire station control access system uh, project. We've got a motion by Director Clark. Somebody seconded. Thank you, Director Sheets. Madam Clerk, uh, please call the roll. Holt. Aye. Wood. Aye. Sheets. Aye. White. Aye. Clark. Aye. Taylor. Aye. And Kelly. Aye. Two passes. All right, excellent. Uh, moving on to our public hearing. Item number one on public hearing is uh, division redistricting. Uh, Chris Chaffee, are you available? So I'm gonna kick us off, President Kelly. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, quickly turn it over to Chris. Uh, but what I want to do is just uh, quickly set the stage for the hearing and give a little background on this issue. Um, our enabling act, the Fire Protection District 1907, requires fire districts uh, to consider redistricting by November 1st following the uh, year of the census. Um, so previously, uh, in, in the past efforts, Metro Fire has worked with county staff um, and our CAD technicians accomplished this, but um, challenges uh, a number of challenges have presented themselves at time around, um, and I'll just quickly go through those. First of all, the census data was delayed due to COVID. Um, typically, we would have that information months beforehand. Um, I think the data has been available for just a couple of weeks, if I'm correct. Um, so really putting a strain on the time to get this process done. Um, there have been some changes to the law regarding the requirements, making this analysis much more sophisticated. Um, and then finally, there's been a, a recent significant lawsuit and a number of law changes that don't necessarily apply to us as a, uh, as a, as a special district, um, but they have established some best practices to consider law redistricting. So because of all those factors, we asked for a subject matter expert and we retained redistricting partners uh, to guide us through this process. Um, and we've asked them to do two things. First, to do look at the initial analysis with the brand new census data, um, and then provide their initial thoughts and findings today for the board for consideration. Um, and then secondly, um, if the recommendation is to move forward with new district boundaries uh, to, to guide us through that process. Uh, so with that, uh, with the remainder of the hearing here, um, I'm going to invite Chris Chappie up from Redistrict Partners to go through his findings. And then we'll turn it back over to President Kelly uh, to take those questions and comments uh, from the public regarding this issue. Uh, then we'd like to hear from the board, uh, any questions and comments. And finally, uh, Council Lover is going to address a couple items for the good of the order. So with that, I will turn Mr. it over. Mr. Fry, did the chief have anything to say? Chief, you good? 
Jeff Fry and Michelle Mahoney have done a tremendous job getting my <laughs> A to here today and the plan for being able to move forward. I support the plan. And um, with the timelines that we have, I think I, I think everything is lining up perfectly right now. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right. Good evening. Thank you uh, for having me today. And I just, sorry, I'm getting used to um, speaking in public once again, um, mostly on, on Zoom. My name is Chris J.P. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Redistricting Partners. We're a local redistricting firm, mostly based in Sacramento, but we work all over the state and the nation actually doing uh, redistricting uh, work with agencies from working with states. Uh, we just got the, um, the contract to work to redistrict the state of New York. Um, through their commission process. Um, and we work with fire districts and water districts and cities and counties all over the state. So thank you again for having me here today. Um, and I just wanna go through like the introduction. First off, your current district lines, looking at the current population numbers, um, what the total deviations are um, of them, then going into kind of what redistricting is really quickly, traditional redistrict principles, um, and then just a, a little bit of talk about census data. So this is your current map. I think you probably can see it better with your printouts in front of you. Um, there are nine districts. I think the biggest thing um, in the redistricting process, and we'll get into this a little bit more, is the number one criteria is rebalancing district lines based on the census. And so you can see, there's a clicker. Um, I don't think the pointer is going to work, but you can look at the deviations on the right hand column where it says 2020 census population and deviations. Um, the underlying case law and uh, principle is that districts, local districts are allowed around a 10% deviation, um, total deviation from your largest district to your smallest. So you can see that your total deviation with your current lines are 24.3%, well above that total of 10. So that's why I think um, we're here today is because um, we really wanna look at your current lines, talk through them with you and the public to get in input on how we're gonna shift those, these current lines to bring your it back into uh, total, to, total of 10% deviation. Um, so what is redistricting? I think everyone's heard about it from a legislative standpoint where we balance things for Congress and the legislature, but it affects any agency like yours that is already in district lines. Um, and really the number one criteria, like I said, is rebalancing them so that there is equal population amongst districts so that we allow, we allow for equal representation and the idea of one person will vote. Um, and there are really are five traditional criteria that we look to Again, relatively equal size, which um, I can go through because we've gone through it already. But the second one is contiguous. Your districts are contiguous. You can draw one, uh, a border with one with a one pen stroke. All everything touches. There's no islands. That's all we're really looking for um, on on whether they're contiguous. Um, the second or the third, sorry, traditional redistricting principle and something that really will guide this process is the ideas of communities of interest. Now, there are many um, communities of interest out there. These are just a handful, senior citizens, students, down, like preserving a downtown core, drawing all the rural areas into one district, um, preserving homeowners or renter areas. But I think for your redistricting, um, we're really gonna look to local government law. Um, I think a lot of your districts currently are uh, based on cities and census designated places and rural versus urban uh, cores. So I think that's really what's going to look, we're going to look to. This is the fourth um, traditional rate criteria and something that most fire districts, water districts, and other service based districts really look to is who they serve, their cities. Um, and then the final, and then um, one thing, as mentioned prior, and a change in current law is the Fair Maps Act. Now, it doesn't apply to um, 
you know, special districts. It only applies to cities and counties. Um, but it's really brought this idea forward is to not split neighborhoods or cities if possible. So that's what, that's one of the things we're, it's, that's, I think, going to guide our actions throughout this process. Now, the final traditional um, criteria is compactness. Um, and your district lines mostly are, are pretty compact now. But it's really the idea of not um, having funny shapes, as some states um, dictate, or measuring the, the circumference. But in California, um, it's really a simple idea, not bypassing nearby populated areas in favor of more distant populated areas. So drawing squares and circles as much as possible. Um, but as many of you probably already know, cities do not have really nice edges, right? They're not really nicely shaped. There's jagged edges and everything else. But when we can, making sure that we draw um, areas together that makes sense. The other um, additional registering rules that have been introduced by the Fair Maps, Fair Maps Act is not considering candidates or incumbents as community centrists and not drawing district lines um, to favor a political party. And then this is where I think the discussion I hope today can go, um, is talking through additional um, items, additional criteria that you, the board or the public think we should look to as we draw to district lines. Um, a couple um, elements out there that cities and counties and special districts have used is using future growth. So looking at where we expect growth to be and underpopulating those areas and overpopulating areas where they've been built out. Balancing rural and the urban interface. Um, we did a fire district in Novato, and one of the things was they wanted to have um, their WUI in at least three of the five districts so that each three uh, board members had that as like a basis for their thought process for the fire district. I thought that was a really interesting decision, but it, that, those are the kind of things I know that fire districts and water districts look to. And then I know it, it came up on our initial call, also looking at where fire stations are and making sure that districts have like a balance of fire districts as much as possible. Um, and there are other additional criteria that we can use. Um, and that's really what, what this first hearing is about, is to talk kind of through the map and have you guys talk about where you think um, certain districts could shrink, get smaller because they, they're overpopulated, or um, expand if they haven't had the growth over the last decade. Um, and just going through our timeline. Um, so of course, tonight is the first introduction. Um, the idea is to come back in October to your next meeting and introduce um, a set of uh, draft plans, at least three, that rebalance the lines, use the criteria that we discussed tonight and your insights and the public's insights to guide our, our, our redraft, um, present those draft plans, sorry, present those draft plans to you, um, and then go through them and have you guys comment if you like plan A, you don't like plan B, make shifts in district lines um, in, in October, and then come back in November with another set of lines um, that are aligned to your comments, and then finish up with a final plan in December. No, I think that's it. I was going to put up. I think I have the, uh, the district lines at the end. So that's the, um, that's my formal presentation, but now I'm over for questions. I'm also open for public comment. And any discussion. Are there any questions of board members for uh, uh, Mr. Chaffee? No questions, discussion. Would anybody like to see the slide that showed the difference in the districts, the numeric differences? Yeah, I'll just Director just... Gould. Let's we'll go back to that, sorry. Get it. Maybe you could just talk just a little bit about the, the population deviation. Sure. And, and on each one of those, because that, that helps Thank you. understand that. Um, yeah, where what are those uh, big areas, little areas, and, and changes that may have to happen? 
So I think the biggest changes in your map, if you look at the highlights of uh, District 6 and District 9, so District 6 is your most um, Western district, kind of tucked up against Sacramento. That has had the largest growth over the decade. It's over deviated. It's total deviation now is, or it's deviation now is 10%. Yeah. And nine, which is Elk Grove rural, I guess it's not really Elk Grove, but it's the part um, attached to Elk Grove and you have an incorporated county portion that has um, not kept pace with the rest of the districts and that's really underpopulated. So those two districts are really causing that 24 total um, popu population deviation. Um, the other districts are also like District 7, again, is uh, right next to 6 and more of the urban core. You've also seen a lot of population growth there. So I think um, talking through uh, shrinking District 6 and 7 geographically, um, expanding District 5 and District 9, um, those are the two um, kind of, I think, points of, of most points of interest. Um, I think another thing that was also talked about was trying to create um, or keep the current configuration where you have six districts above the river and three districts below the river. So if you think of these, you know, as the six districts and the three districts as, as like separate ecosystems, shifting, um, you would probably take population from four into nine. Um, and then in the northern parts, you would swap between five, six, and seven. You'd basically probably move seven over into six and then move five more into seven. You could also maybe cut off the tops of six and seven. Um, that makes sense from a fire, fire perspective. Mm. Just one on one, we talked about uh, District Four, that there's a lot of new growth that is coming, but a lot of it is going to be out a ways before that. And you right. had some thoughts on that too. So I think um, I think with growth, it's 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 important to make it as a you know a sixth or seventh criteria because we don't necessarily know when it's going to happen. Um, but I think it's good to align it. I know if this is four is going to grow a lot and it's already overpopulated, then maybe we should shrink it even more. It should be underpopulated to start the decade if we assume that the most growth, the fastest is gonna grow in that kind of eastern part um, of four, then that would just mean that maybe nine extends all the way to your western border. Um, and four just becomes a lot more compact, just a, kind of above nine. Um, and I think if you did those, um, those swaps of four and nine, I think you probably would have a much more balanced um, southern Three districts because eight, the one that's all over that includes Rancho, is right, it's almost perfect from a population standpoint. Um, if there is a line in here that you think needs to change, that would be no big deal. But uh, the current kind of uh, boundaries of eight work from a population standpoint. Not to interrupt you, but uh, maybe in, now that we've looked at that slide, if we could look at the one that you put up earlier of the district boundaries. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then just can we talk a little bit about how we talked about laying the fire stations over it? Yeah, so one of the things we'll, we'll do is um, you've already given us the shape files with the fire stations points. So we're gonna plot them on, on this map. Um, and then any maps we present to you in October will have them plotted. So you can see what the shifts have done with the underwater fire station uh, locations. Um, we can update this the memo uh, or really the map and um, with the fire stations placement so you know where they are now. By district, you probably already do, but sometimes looking at them on a map makes makes it easier. All right. <clears throat> Any questions or comments by directors? Seeing none. Okay. Do you have anything uh, to wrap up with, Mr. Jaffe? No, um, we'll be giving you new maps with the fire stations uh, next week. Um, and 
look forward to presenting in October with some draft plans that you guys can dissect and tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was a presentation item. Uh, Mr. Lavra, have you got anything to yeah, uh, add? A few things I would add. We should first uh, clarify for the record that there's no public speakers here today that wish to ask questions or provide any input, nor do we have anybody now on the line from the public that would want to uh, make any comment. So if we could do that first. Art, if you can unmute, please, and just see if there's anybody who would like to speak. I was not contacted ahead of time by anybody. Attendees, you have the ability to unmute yourselves if there's anything you would like to add at this time. Appears that no one desires to speak. All right. Uh, the next thing is uh, just to bring the uh, board's attention uh, was that uh, last time the district went through a redistricting analysis you know, 10 years ago, um, the board uh, uh, selected or created and selected an ad hoc committee of, I believe, three board members that uh, worked with the staff and worked with the consultants and uh, others to review some of this information and to provide. Uh, uh, advice uh, moving forward uh, to the whole board. Um, we still are on a, um, you know, we have time. We're, as we sit now, we're on a pretty, I would say, tight schedule, considering we have another, one more board meeting in September 2 in October, and the redistricting has to be uh, approved final by November 1. So we have time, but not a ton of time, that if the boards uh, wanted to consider appointing an ad hoc committee. I believe there's grounds for the board to take up that item as an action item tonight, even though it's not on the agenda. Um, the rules for doing that are that there has to be an immediate need uh, to take that action. And I would uh, conclude under the authorities that there is an immediate need uh, due to the fact that this data would normally have been submitted by the federal government in March uh, 21st of 2021. It wasn't uh, issued until August 21st, 2021, so five months uh, uh, delay on that. I don't know exactly when the district had their hands uh, on that information, but it's been relatively recently. So we're up against that time uh, restriction. Uh, moreover, uh, I know that uh, myself and Chief Arms and uh, Jeff Fry and Michelle um, met with uh, Mr. Chaffee on Tuesday, which was after the agenda was posted. And he went through some of the numbers and went through the deviations and went through the maps and concluded that based on the data that he had before him at that time, although not 100% complete with what he wanted to do, that he anticipated that there would be a recommendation from his uh, point of view that some lines be redrawn as part of the redistricting. So I feel comfortable in saying that the agency staff did not know until after the agenda was posted that there was uh, uh, this need to uh, do the redis to redraw the lines and do the redis redistricting. So if that's something that the board wanted to consider doing this time around, uh, I just bring that to the board's attention. If they want to consider that, if they do, uh, board, board member will have to make a motion and second it uh, to hear uh, the matter uh, even though it's not posted on the agenda, and there'd have to be a two thirds vote to approve that, which would be five votes here tonight. So that's Thank all. Thank you. I just wanted to bring that. Thank together. you. So, uh, board members, um, as John indicated, I think it's important that we have an opportunity to discuss this matter further and possibly make a motion to uh, assemble an ad hoc committee. Uh, so, with that, I would accept a motion to add this item to the agenda and give us the opportunity to have this discussion. And uh, I would appreciate if somebody would uh, make that motion. Sure, I'll make a motion that we uh, take a vote on an ad hoc committee for purposes of the redistricting as while we're discussing. It would actually be a motion. I'll, I'll hear that. I'll make a motion to hear the motion. 
Thank you. Because <laughs> then you're going to have to do another motion if that's motion seconded and approved. I second that motion. All right. We had a motion by Director Woods. Uh, I heard a second by Director Sheets. Thank you. And uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Director Gould? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. White? Aye. Clark? Aye. Sanders? Aye. And Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Um, I've given this a little bit of thought. And I, <coughs> excuse me, um, my, my initial thought, and I'm open to suggestions otherwise, but I looked at our district and I saw Director Sailors in the very north. I saw Director Orzali in the east, and I saw Director Jones in the south and the east. And I thought that uh, uh, the three of them as an ad hoc committee uh, to work on this would be good. And um, the uh, uh, the advantage of just having the three is uh, they wouldn't be subject to Brown Act. We wouldn't have to notice the meetings and so forth. So I think that's a, a good number. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts on it? No? Uh, then I would accept a motion to uh, to appoint an ad hoc committee, as uh, I just described. Chair, I make a motion. To I would second it. All right, Director Sailors with the motion, Director Clark with the second. The motion was to form an ad hoc committee with Directors Sailor, Sailors, uh, uh, Director Orzali, who I had. Anyways, Director Rosali and Director uh, Jones. Director Jones. Uh, um, motion and a second. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Wools? Aye. Wood? Aye. Sheets? Aye. White? Aye. Aye. Clark? Aye. Taylors? Aye. And Kelly? Aye. Motion passes. All right, then. Thank you for uh, working that in. And the ad hoc committee will uh, be formed. And Madam Clerk, will you make sure that you reach out uh, and notify the uh, ad hoc committee of their appointment? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, on to reports. Uh, President's report, I have nothing to, to add. Uh, Fire Chief. Good evening, directors. Uh, just a number of things here. First off, I would like to thank Ken Campbell. Ken, where did he go? He's gone. Okay, I still like to thank him. Uh, uh, the opportunity to sit down and, and knowing Ken beforehand, but coming in with Amanda Levy and working through the budget and everything has just been tremendous. And then I know him and Dave have been working a lot, getting ready for the, the next transition. So tonight's presentation was his last presentation. And it has us set up and moving forward and it has really been good. We are going to keep Ken on contract for a little while just because of his expertise, really just across the state and with fire district. So thanks very much on that. Uh, Aaron Castleman, Aaron, oh, she's still here too. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, as you can see, once again, she's done just an outstanding job with grants and working to get those put together. Um, she said it very nicely, but we really tasked her with almost a, over a half a million dollar, yeah, over half a million dollar grant for the dispatch center. Uh, all the fire departments worked together for it, but it was really uh, Aaron's expertise for being able to put it all down, being able to do that. Um, and really, if you think about it, what it does is it looks at where all our apparatus is and then tells the system where they should be in very predictable three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon. So once again, Aaron, thank you. And continuing on with, with putting those things together. Um, Jeff Fry and Michelle Dahoney, thank you both for what we just saw here, which was uh, a great presentation and start for redistricting. I have learned more in the last few weeks about that. And well, I think we all have of being able to go through so it seemed very seamless, but the amount of work that both of them put in for being able to 
really very late getting the census data. So being able to sit down and do that and move, forward, move forward, I think is just is really good. And I'd like to thank them. Um, also, as far as the, the other one, and, and Chief Mitchell will talk more about is just our crews out there. He'll talk about some of the incidents that we've had in the region and their responses and, and being able to get out there. So thanks to that group too. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, Captain Joe Smith for Schmidt for his being selected for the EMS Day Captain assignment. He started here on the 7th, and so it's great to see Joe that he volunteered slash assigned to his position, but he is here with us, and uh, he's, he's doing a great job already. Um, we also had a number of people that Parker went through as the PIO and picked for backup. Uh, relief, I shouldn't say backup, but relief PIO. So mm -hmm. Captain Mark Nunez, Captain Jordan Oates, Supervising Inspector Diane Schmidt, Engineer Bowl Effect, and then Engineer Eric Schaff, uh, Satch. So they will be part of the team then for the relief on the PIO. I think that is great too. Congratulations to Fire Mechanic Phil Morell. Um, he left the district on 9 1 after 28 years as a mechanic. So congratulate to him too. Um, just a, a lot of meetings and, and a lot of activity kind of across the district between COVID response, staffing, and everything else that you can imagine. But um, yesterday we had a, a meeting and it really was guided on wall time. And one of the things that is absolutely crushing us in the district um, is the wall time, the amount of time that our units are spending offloading uh, we have seen call volume that has gone up, but the ability to get units back in service. Um, we shared a letter that uh, basically uh, Metro put together along with the other departments. Um, it got the attention and we had a meeting with area CEOs. We had the LIMSA that was there along with the uh, county medical director, some county staff, and then the fire chiefs. Um, we pushed back very hard on the system. And during the meeting, there was a lot of talk about uh, understanding the problem and everybody agreed that there was a problem, but there really was nothing for being able to move forward. Uh, we talked about some violations that had happened and that we were um, basically turning those violations into the debate. Um, we talked a lot about um, the poor support that we feel we're getting from the LEMSA um and actually had uh last wednesday had a individual die on one of our gurneys at one of our local hospitals and went through and started to get some movement forward um it was disappointing from the limsa that when we talked about some options of treat and release or i shouldn't say that treat and refer and then treat and transport to alternative destinations um, they tried to compare and say, well, it's really because of the fires that are going on that is causing this problem, of which we were able to um, basically um, squash. And then the other one was that it would take us months to be able to go through this and figure these things out, even though there was a plan that was started really uh, in January. And, um, and then tried to tell us that it was worse in January than it is now and that it is going to flatten out and go away. So I will say that the, the meeting was not a, a very popular meeting, but it was very into the details of wanting to move forward. And it has been a very busy day to day following up. And we will have a meeting next Thursday of all the CEOs along with the LIMSA again. So we'll see what happens. Um, one of the other meetings that we had was a meeting with the membership. And Director Sailors was there with us. We had uh, basically the room here filled up with a number of people. Um, we gave an update on Station 41 and Station 53, in which the second bathrooms and showers have been completed. Our next project at Station 21, um, there was some concern about um, the amount of money that had been spent on those stations, and it was exaggerated. We were able to, to look at station 41 and 53 because we have really our own staff and their chief wagon staff that are here that, that were able to do the work. So they were about three to five thousand dollars each, and we did everything internally. So they were not hundreds of thousands of dollars that were spent on those. But at the end of the day, they, uh, the facilities that are there today are, are just 
what I would say, um, additional showers, bathrooms to meet the needs and the diversity of our of our district. We're moving forward with it. The same thing with 21. I know that there's some projects that that uh, we, we just have to be able to get done. So we'll start probably in about a month at Station 21. And again, it'll be the same. Probably our biggest challenge is over at Station 23. It is just uh, old and trying to figure out what's the best options. And, and some of that may actually be where we really go through and re remodel the station and stuff. But we, we have been committed to doing that and moving forward. So we got a lot of good feedback from that. One of the other things that was talked about was the catastrophic leave policy. And um, there was a lot of discussions over the last year about just the name of it. And so in discussions, we came up with a, a donated leave policy. Um, the, truly, the policy itself will stay the same, but the name will change to a donated leave. We have probably about five different policies that are at 522 now for review. Once they go through a review, we'll bring it back to the board. But it was uh, it was definitely something that was emotional as far as the name, and so making a change I think was really positive for that for being able to move forward. Uh, we also talked about things that we wanted to be able to cover and kind of focus on over the next two years. And one of those things that are there, uh, we talked a lot about our culture. We talked a lot about promotions, the recruitment of a diverse uh, population, and, and what are some of the things that we can do. Um, and then officer uh, supervisor training support. And I thought one of the things that was a really good conversation when we talked about the, the work and the culture, um, there were some conversations about training and one of the ones was, well, we'll put some stuff online to be able to do online training. Um, to me, I don't think that changes an organization is that uh, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not the best that when I go to online training, I figure out what I need to do at the end of it to get it accomplished and go through it. And it, I don't know if it really, um, I hate to admit it, but sometimes it probably isn't a learning more than it is, it's a checkbox of going through. But some of the things that came out that I thought was great was using a system like a green sheet, which is when something bad happens on the fire ground, it's shared with everybody, it's discussed. And, and while we, might, we uh, won't pick individual events that are here, but there's more than enough events that we can talk about and, and talking about interactions in a fire station or a culture or growing. Um, there's websites that are online that will have different things. And using those things as training tools and using those to bring awareness um, that can be done at a company level, that can be done at a battalion level, that can be done in academies. Uh, captain's academies, but a way to bring awareness and then to bring expectations on what is the right way for moving forward. Um, the other part about it was on there that we talked a lot about was recruitment. And one of the things that, that I had said was that I feel we have part-time recruitment. And, and by what I meant by that was usually it's somebody that's assigned to the field and then it's their part-time job on their days off or when they have some extra time. And so we committed to moving forward October 1st. Um, uh, Firefighter White will be coming to staff and we will work on putting on a plan together and figuring out what that looks like as we move forward with him in a temporary position for a little while. So I think it was a very positive meeting. At the end of it, I asked the group, do we continue to meet? Do we want to move forward? And I think probably 99% of the people said, yes, let's continue to meet and work on what we have started here. Um, the last item before I turn it over to Chief Mitchell is a, uh, an event that happens each year it's called the EMS Memorial Bike Ride. And it's across the United States and here locally they would normally have rode from South Lake Tahoe down to Rancho Cordova to the capital and then out to San Francisco. Uh, on the 23rd though, they're going to start here obviously because of the fire, start here at Rancho Cordova and then uh, ride down to uh, the state capitol. They'll have a, a small event there, and then they'll ride, probably I think over the next day, they ride all the way down to San Francisco and they'll have another event. They're raising money for an EMS memorial. Um, we have been involved with it over the years in supporting it. This year, one of our retired captains, Matt McGrew, is riding in it. And uh, he is riding in the name of, of um, uh, Kyle, who um, 
passed away last year. Um, and with the funding, uh, Chief Law, who is obviously connected with Matt McGrew, is matching up to $5,000 that goes to Kyle's family um, directly. And so we're going to support Chief Law in that and, and be able to move forward. Their goal is to raise $20,000 um, on this West Coast ride. And Chief Law, as I said, is going to match up to $5,000 of that and give that directly uh, to Kyle or to Kyle Stammer. That ends my report, unless you have any questions for me. Now we'll have Chief Mitchell with the Ops Report. Thanks, Chief Barnes. Dean President Kelly, Board of Directors, Adam Mitchell, Deputy Chief of Operations with tonight's Ops Report. Uh, I'm going to start off with. Um, um, a CERT update. Um, our, that program um, has been and it's been doing very well, and I think it's important to recognize their commitment to our organization, what they've done and been doing re recently um, in response to some of our incidents. The first one is um, we've had nine members um, that responded up to the Caldor incident and provided 55 staff hours between August 29th and September 5th, and their staffing. Um, a call center as well as large animal um, evacuation facilities uh, up there and doing just a phenomenal job representing our organization but but um, you know volunteering at time of being there so that's that's a really big positive for them um, and they continue to volunteer the chief Eric is here and, and um, come converses with them often and they've been a very valuable piece of, of the organization that represented us up there and then the second uh, item that they participated in recently on uh, Friday, August 28th, we had a um, fire down in the Time Nines area. Um, CERT responded to that incident. It's not typical for us to have a long duration event of multiple hours, and that incident specifically involved a lot of um, homes and um, a large area. And so uh, we, we went through Chief Eureka and we activated the CERT members, and they came down and they set up in the area for rehab for our firefighters as well as some, some of the victims of the fire to be able to provide them waters, shade, chairs, things like that. Um, so they showed up, jumped right in there, and, and, and did a phenomenal job to help stand up our logistics folks and our reserve firefighters as well. So that was a very big positive one to pass that on to A second item is just an update on what we have going on out on the Office of Emergency Service Response. Um, we continue to have two engines uh, up on the Caldor incident on two different strike teams or task forces. We just rotated, uh, we are rotating tomorrow. I believe it's our fourth two week rotation on our Type 3 OES engine, 8433. And we'll send up four new crew members. Those crew members have been up there for the last two weeks. They'll come home, we'll send four new ones up there, and they'll continue to work um, through the busy fire season that we have. Um, the other strike team that's up there um, during the time where the fire came across the crest and started going into South Lake Tahoe. The incident reached out as a critical need and with uh, in the region we rallied together and we were able to get another company out of our district to respond to their immediate need went right into the uh, christmas valley area that night and provided structure protection and happy to report that that evening when they were there as one of the strike teams early on had just one outbuilding loss and one exterior fire they extinguished with no homes lost in that area so those folks are still out there working as well um, good news there. Um, we also have a couple of support personnel, a couple of our mechanics. They were to draw down and based off of the duration of the incidents that have been going on, there's a need to support the fleet. And so two of our mechanics that are carded to provide general mechanic services, um, Schaefer Cell was able to push those folks up there too, and they're still there. So um, that one just keeps on going and, and our folks are there helping out. Second, an incident happened up here in uh, Placer County near Forest Hill. The Auburn, uh, American River confluence um, below the bridge it was the bridge incident that started back on um, Sunday, September 5th. Um, during that time, based off of, again, this, the resource drawdown, they reached out to us and said, we need some help. Can you send some engines from Sacramento? And so we were able to form up quickly right out of the fire stations and initial attack strike team. Metro Fire responded three of our type three engines and an on-duty battalion chief and brought in another off-duty battalion chief as a strike team leader along with two, an engine from Folsom and an engine from Sacramento Fire, and they drove lights and sirens up the hill in the case of that incident. Um, happy to report. Um, and our copter also was dispatched up there. Um, happy to report that they were able to get around that very quickly. And I believe it was 
it was 400 and some odd acres that they were able to contain that fire. Um, based off the complexity and again, resource drawdown, um, the unit also requested response from the Sacramento Regional Incident Management Team. So they responded up there, engaged and helped them build the plan and support logistically. So our members continue to be very active through fire season, both here in our own district with vegetation fires, um, but also in our, in our surrounding communities. And, and when our time of need, I'm very comfortable that based off our support that we've been giving, those folks would come help us when we make that call. So uh, next item uh, is ambulance drawdown. Chief Harms men mentioned the challenges we've seen with ambulance patient offload time, APOT or wall time. Um, unfortunately, that creates a challenge for us in operations. And we have pretty much been managing ambulance drawdown challenges day to day at this point. Um, we've been getting the system drawdown levels to critical, I would call. Um, also, you know, we get to a zero ambulance status in the system in a county of our size. That's a big problem for us. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, we got right there. We got right to zero. We reached out. Um, some folks made some great decisions that day. I will say I'm very proud of this organization and our chief officer staff, as well as our line personnel, made some decisions that had never been made before. And we were able to make sure that there was not a call for service, did not get an ambulance responded based off of some very um, creative ways of bringing some additional resources into the system that we hadn't, hadn't gone into before. Um, so with call volume being up, that is a factor, but I think it's for us as a district, um, we have, and, and Chief Harms mentioned, some of the criteria we're using to go after fixing that. We can't just keep treating the symptom. We can't put more ambulances out there. We can't just keep hiring people. We can't continue just to treat that. We have to go on a longer term um, approach on fixing it. Um, and so to, to, to work on that, um, we're committed to meeting with our partners. We have been, we're working with the LEMSA um, to be able to streamline it and really write our plan down of how to deal with it, but also long term how to fix it. Um, and that's, that's probably our most, uh, there's many things that we're dealing with, but that's probably our most critical need right now to try to figure out how to make that work. So, um, and then finally, just some statistics. Uh, we've had 5,175 calls since our last report. We're just about 370 calls a day, so still very busy out there. Um, we've had 20 building fires that our crews have responded to. Eight have been ours. Um, one of those being that four alarm fire that we had down in South Sacramento um, back on the 28th um, that included the fatality. And, and I don't know the final number. I know it was about a dozen-ish uh, mobile homes and the number of, of home res single family residences as well. That was a big incident for us. Um, but we also had uh, just yesterday morning on the 8th, we had four significant incidents in the county um, in the early morning hours, so between midnight and, and you know 6 a.m. Um, we had the fire uh, that was the price all covered on the news on Roseville Road that was underneath the bridge, the homeless encampment. We had a, a multi-unit mobile home uh, fire that was over on Auburn. Uh, we had two multi-alarm grass fires down the American River Parkway west of Watt Avenue. Um, it was a very busy night for B-Shift. Um, we ended up taking command of two of those incidents um, with, our, with our chief officers due to the drawdown. Um, we, over that time, um, also committed 19 of our units. And so those folks worked really hard. I actually got a phone call the next day from Sacramento Fire Department's um, assistant chief who was covering and said, I just wanted to reach out and say thank you. Your crews were phenomenal. There wasn't one complaint that came in. They really worked hard and they really helped us out. And I, I don't think I mentioned this, but all four of those incidents were in Sacramento Fire Department's jurisdiction. So they were they were all automatic aid incidents that responded to over that night. So our crews really stepped up and did a great job. Uh, and then uh, actually, just to mention this, because it's different this time, our busiest engine company was Engine 109 over the last two weeks with uh, 202 responses. And our busiest ambulance was Medic 105 with 223 responses. Mm. That's it for uh, the operations report, unless there's any questions. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Uh, any uh, determination on the cause of the fires along the uh, Roseville Road and Auburn Boulevard? Uh, is it a uh, cause of arson or anything like that? Do, do we know that? Well, Director, that uh, those are um, under investigation still, and those are Sacramento Fire Department's jurisdiction. However, I will say, that specifically, I did have a conversation with their chiefs over there um, about the parkway fires, the two multi-alarm parkway fires, and those are both very suspicious and they are um, moving forward with uh, potentially having identified a suspect um, and trying to figure out how to um, um, 
you know, mitigate that and, and make contact with that suspect as of yesterday when I was on the phone with them. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions of uh, Director, or excuse me, Deputy Chief Mitchell's uh, report? Well, thank you, sir. Moving on, uh, we have SAC Metro Fire uh, Firefighters Local 522 report. Is uh, Mr. McGoldrick with us? No, I don't believe. No? Okay. I didn't see him online either. All right, uh, moving uh, on to committee and delegate reports. Uh, executive committee, we have nothing to report. Uh, Communications Center JPA, Deputy Chief Wagaman. No report tonight, President Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the California Fire Rescue Training JPA, Chief Harms. No report. All right, moving on to the Finance and Audit Committee. Did anybody attend that meeting this evening? Report out for Director Orzali. No, no report. Okay, moving on to policy committee. Director Gould left our meeting about 6.55, I think. He sent me a message that he needed to, uh, he needed to depart. So no, uh, no report there. How about board members, questions and comments? Director White. Thank you, President Kelly. Um, just a few comments. I wanna thank Ken Campo for the strong work that he has done um, regarding this year's uh, final budget. Also, Erin Castleberry for her work on the grants and Shea Purcell and his whole team for keeping our fleet in service. I actually demoed from the Caldor fire today and it was very comforting to me to see uh, AFPD mechanics um, were the ones that were ensuring that the vehicles were safe to return to their home agency. So um, thank you. And then of course, to all the members who have been stepping up during this very active uh, fire season and working tirelessly and many additional hours. Um, and I wanna commend the command staff and those that are working diligently to try and improve the APOC uh, situation. As we know, the uh, you know arrival to patient offloading time has just been increasing, and it's um, becoming a compounding problem. And you know, it's got a lot of uh, you know, it's creating ripple effects that are are detrimental to the organization. So I'm glad to see that there is a a focused effort on really trying to achieve um, a better outcome. So thank you. Thank you, Director White. Uh, Director Sheets. Good evening. Um, I wanted to take this time to thank our last board meeting speaker, Mr. Warren, uh, for his comments. After the meeting, I've had some time to reflect on my thoughts and how to respond. And I wanted to write it down because I didn't want to forget anything. I'm absolutely appalled and embarrassed that a member of our community felt it was safer to privately transport his ill wife to the hospital rather than allow our first responders to care for her. He expressed his fear of allowing potentially unvaccinated care for her outweighed any benefit and could potentially put her in grave danger. I find this unacceptable. I've been a registered nurse for over 20 years. I trust science and I trust the recommendations of our physician leaders. This is who we go to for care when we're sick. Our hospitals are at capacity and there's no end in sight. This current surge is preventable and it's shocking and irresponsible that healthcare providers are not advocating this truth. Vaccines work. Just like our first responders are tired, our hospital staff are exhausted. It is like Groundhog Day and I'm terrified what this is doing to our healthcare professionals and their mental health. Hospital capacity is at our winter peak surge, and we're just entering flu season. It's unbelievable to me that people in our community don't trust the science, but they do once they're sick and are overwhelmingly the unvaccinated population. 
This has placed our healthcare system near its breaking point. Elective surgeries have been postponed. Our ERs are significantly impacted. Our inpatient side must make hard and unimaginable decisions on restricting visitors and loved ones from visiting their family members when they're dying or those who are seeking medical treatment. Preventing best friends from visiting their colleague who has received cancer treatment or experienced a stroke. It is unacceptable and it is heartbreaking. Wear a mask, wash your hands. For those of you who are eligible, please get vaccinated so we can be done with this nightmare. And please above all be safe. That's all. Thank you for that, Director Sheets. Um, Director Wood. I couldn't say it any more eloquently than Director Sheets has, so I'll leave that at that. Thank you. Uh, Director Gould has left us. Uh, Director Clark. All I can say is, Director Sheets, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank, thank her for those words that she she expressed. I, I, I concur with those, those, those sentiments. Thank you. Director Sailors. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to take this off so you can hear me better. I, I too concur with what Director Sheets just said. I too would like to see this nightmare end. But I, I also would like to thank everyone for their presentations tonight. I also would like to thank Chief Larms for speaking about the meeting with the brave men and women that came and had the serious, difficult conversations about how to change the culture of this fire district. It's difficult conversations like that that help these crazy times get better for everyone. I'm also looking forward to um, uh, Tim White's a new position starting on October 1st. And I'm looking forward to his first presentation to us. And I'm looking forward to seeing him at the regional diversity meeting whenever we have the next one. I know it's coming up at the end of this month. So please, everyone out there, please stay safe. Get vaccinated. Please help us end this nightmare. Thank you, Chair. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, Director White, Director Sheets, Director Sailors, thank you for saying it all. I appreciate the input of all directors this evening, uh, the staff reports. Uh, Chief, thank you for doing the, the job you do and uh, welcome uh, Mr. O'Toole. All right then, uh, John Lavra, I'd be remiss in not thanking you for your help on our issues this evening. And uh, board clerk, Michelle Dahoney, you're doing a fabulous job. Thank you. If I missed anybody, I apologize. Uh, I hope I hope everybody has a, a great uh, evening and a, a good weekend coming up. Thank you. Uh, this would adjourn uh, the board meeting for the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District on September 9th. Have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.